following is a CUNY TV special presentation. Good evening and welcome to the Graduate Center. My name is Chase Robinson and I'm the president of the Graduate Center. And it is a great privilege to welcome you all to this, the inaugural event of our 1415 season of public programming. We could not be more delighted to host tonight's conversation, which features two of the country's most prominent advocates for the middle class, Senator Elizabeth Warren and Professor Paul Krugman. Now, as some of you will know, the Graduate Center is a Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. It's a center for applied and theoretical research. And it is, as we're seeing tonight, a platform for performance, conversation, and public debate. As a community of students and scholars committed to the unconventional idea that learning is a public good, we regularly offer public programs that feature eminent thinkers, cultural leaders, and distinguished artists addressing some of today's most pressing issues. And indeed, the economic struggle of the American middle class is one such issue. Today, the middle class is buffeted from a multitude of directions. The minimum wage has effectively stagnated. Easy, affordable access to health care, particularly women's health care, remains more aspiration than reality. Even student loans, once a ready tool for personal and economic advancement, have become tremendous burdens for many. These are just a few of the urgent political and policy questions that we face. And tonight, we're in the company of three people who can help and make sense of these problems and help us begin moving towards solutions. First, Elizabeth Warren was elected to the U.S. Senate from Massachusetts in 2012. A former professor of Harvard Law School, a former professor at Harvard Law School, Senator Warren served as chair of the Congressional Oversight Panel for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP, and later established the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau under President Obama before running for office. A Fighting Chance, the Senator's most recent book, was published in April. Paul Krugman is Nobel Prize winning economist. <laughs> New York Times columnist and blogger and author, most recently of End This Depression Now. He is Professor of Economics and International Affairs at Princeton, Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School, and a distinguished scholar here at the Graduate Center's Luxembourg Income Study Center. You'll indulge me as I prove incapable of resisting the temptation to note that Professor Krugman will be joining the Graduate Center faculty in the fall. Finally, it is my pleasure to introduce the evening's moderator, the Graduate Center's own Janet Gornick, Professor of Political Science. <laughs> professor of Political Science and Sociology and Director of the Graduate Center's Luxembourg Income Study Center. For over 30 years, Janet has been a leading researcher and educator in the field of American social policy, especially as it affects families. Her most recent book, co-edited with Marcos Yanti, is Income Inequality, Economic Disparities, and the Middle Class in Affluent Countries. Finally, as your programs note, funding for tonight's event is provided by the Leader Family Fund, to which we are deeply grateful. Please join me. Please do join me in welcoming our distinguished speakers. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I want to just take a second, Senator Warren, to echo what Chase said and to welcome you here to the Graduate Center of the City University of New York at what I think we've discerned is your first visit here. We think so. And we Thank think you. so, and we hope the first of many. Uh, and Professor Krugman also, of course, I want to welcome you here for your inaugural event since you've joined us here at the Graduate Center in July, and we are all very delighted that you'll be here uh, for the long term, and by long term, I and many of us interpret that to mean the rest of your life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's our hope. So, um, hoping is long. I, yes. Uh, why not? Over the next hour or so, I am going to pose a series of questions to you. Uh, and my hope is, of course, to give you ample time to answer them and to talk to one another. But of course, as you both know also, I'm going to push you along because there are several topics uh, that I know you both care about very deeply, including consumer protection, student debt, uh, women's health care, the instability of shift work, and low pay, and I hope that we'll preserve our time uh, for each of these. So, uh, and just to close with a bit of logistics, if time permits, I'm going to take one or two questions that have been submitted by the audience. Um, so to the audience, please note that at about 10 past 8, uh, staff will come and collect your questions, and you can pass them down um, when you see that that process is underway. So let's get started. So Senator Warren, many of us came to know you. Uh, from the work that you did to establish the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Good. I think yes. most people know, uh, uh, is charged with watching out for American consumers as they shop for financial products and services. So this summer, the CFPB, your baby, just marked its third birthday. Mm -hmm. So what's your verdict on the first three years? What has the Bureau achieved? And what, how do you hope to see it strengthened and expanded in the future? Oh, thank you. So. Uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is something that was born of a terrible problem in this country, and that was that some of the biggest financial institutions had figured out that they could really make a lot of money by targeting hardworking families, particularly those who were just kind of struggling, stretching right at the edges. And they basically figured out they could make millions, shoot, push it into the billions ultimately over time by cheating people on mortgages, by cheating people on credit cards, by cheating people on payday loans, just keep the list going. And the problem was we had a lot of consumer laws. We just didn't have an agency who would get out there and enforce them. So the Office of the Controller of the Currency had some responsibility and the Fed had some responsibility and the uh, FDIC had some responsibility, and for everybody it was kind of like somewhere on their list. The idea behind the agency was to take all these laws, put them in one place, have one agency that would have both the authority to do something and the responsibility to do something. And what was the something? To stop the cheating. To make sure that we had some rules in place that would level the playing field and have some transparency in what these financial products are all about. This little consumer agency has just been up and running, as you say, for three years now, and it has already returned $4 billion to American consumers who were cheated by big financial institutions. That's pretty damn good, pretty good. In addition to that, it's out there, it writes the rules, it monitors some of what the banks are up to, but here's the part that's really exciting. It's created a web, a, a, an online uh, complaint hotline so that if you think you've been tricked or cheated or squeezed or fooled or trapped or whatever it was, you can go online and also do it by phone, but you can go online and you can file a complaint. You name what it is and what the bank's done, and by golly, the information goes directly first to the agency. The agency puts a tracker on it, sends it over, to uh, the bank or the mortgage company or whatever it is, and tracks what happens. And here's why this one is so important. People are actually, A, getting responses. That is, banks that are saying, you know, maybe we will reverse that charge. Maybe uh, this wasn't quite right because they've got the consumer agency standing here behind the consumer. But the second part is, it's all happening transparently. You can go online and track by financial institution, by kind of product, by uh, part of the country, where the complaints are coming from. And that starts to change the whole credit market. It changes it in the sense that, you know, you could have been cheated by a big financial institution, and you could have been, and you could have been, but we don't have any way 
to see each other, to tell each other, and to tell the rest of the world out there what's happening and what that institution is doing. What this new complaint hotline does is that it makes visible which companies are pulling what tricks and uh, whether or not they're doing more of it, less of it, changing their practices, backing up when they get caught. And there's at least some evidence now that the companies are starting to change in response. And that gets me to the best part. This is ultimately about getting markets to work for real people so that there's transparency, you don't get fooled, there's not tricks buried in the fine print, that's part of what the agency does. But it's also so that we get a much more transparent and virtuous feedback loop about which companies are the companies that are putting out an honest and fair product and which companies are not. So you ask me how that little agency is done in its first years, it's out there getting its job done. And I, I just couldn't be happier about it. I think it's terrific. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I, I think actually it's really important because one of the things we see here is that you can get enormous progress without, it, it's not actually, you know, it's, it's portrayed on the right as this jackbooted you know, agency clamping down on freedom. It's actually increasing freedom because it makes people know. I, I was actually thinking of, since I'm spending more time in New York, you know, New York is a great place where it gets food stands, all these things. Do I feel that the fact that New York has a pretty vigilant health department, you can see it closes things, do, do I think that reduces my freedom, my choice of restaurants? No, it actually means, it actually increases my freedom because I can be reasonably sure, not 100%, but reasonably sure that I'm not going to uh, contract uh, food poisoning. And, and so this is creating the rules within which a market can flourish. And it's a really, really good thing. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually, it's, one, it's, you know, we talk, it's a little bit more than the nudges that some of the behavioral no, people it's talk. it's more than that. It's more than that, but it, it's, it's still fairly light touch in the sense that it's mostly about getting the information out there and it makes it work. And it's, uh, it's incredible that we didn't do this before. Because what we do now, I mean, when every, somebody says, oh, well, let markets work, you want to say, get, you know, get real. What we knew, I was rereading re -reading Ned Gramlich, yeah. who was saying that you know, all of the most complex financial products, the things that people had trouble understanding, were being sold to the least sophisticated consumers. And so now we're doing something about that. It's a great thing. That's right. Okay, wonderful. What do you think, though, that, you know, one of the complaints that we've heard from the right on this, we were just reading yeah. the Heritage Foundation's uh, comments on the Bureau, not, not entirely favorable. Um, I'm shocked. Is yeah. the, the, argue, the question they're asking is, why don't we trust people? Why the nanny state? Why don't we trust people to read the fine print? I have print and, you know, trust people to read the 32 pages of legalese that is tacked on in what is called in the industry mice type because mice would go blind trying to read it. I understand this. That is the point. The point was, this is how the instruments were designed. Go back and look at credit cards. Oh, there was a time. Look at credit cards. Look at the Bank of America credit card back in, credit card agreement back in 1980. It was about a page and a half long. You could see the terms. And by golly, you could read them. You could figure yeah. out, did you want this one or did you want that one? You could kind of see what the risks were. What happens over time to these credit card agreements? Shortly before the consumer agency was passed into law, credit card agreements had hit about 30 pages. And believe me, the extra 28 and a half pages was not to help the consumer. And here was the key. There was lots of stuff in there that was perfectly benign. It really was. There were plenty of sentences in there that didn't hurt anybody. But it was like the foliage that hid the muggers. So that... Now, you want to know how I really feel about this? <laughs> yeah. um, so that the idea was, you just put the hooks in there that would get people, that people didn't understand, hey, wait a minute, this card is different from that card because if my income changes, they can change the interest rate, they can do a, what's called, it was called then a universal default clause, all kinds of things. And here was the bad part about this. It goes back to the key about markets. Once all of that greenery is out there, once all of that fine print is out there, the market no longer works. Being a good competitor, that is, you're someone who's willing to do this on a straight up, you know, here's the risk assessment, here's the interest rate, here are the penalty fees, you can see the whole thing, and you're competing against someone who's 
hidden a lot of tricks in the fine print. You can't outcompete them because the customer can't see the difference between them. So when we talk about freedom, I think, I think you're exactly right about this, Paul. What gives people freedom? What gives them freedom are the basic rules that say it's going to be transparent. And in this case, transparent does not mean 30 pages of fine print. Transparent means it's short enough and written in English so that people can actually read it and understand it. And that then people could lay three credit card agreements on the table or three mortgages on the table and say, oh, wait a minute. That's the one I want. That's the one that's the better product. Now the market starts to work for the customer. Yeah. Um, two, two quick things. Uh, one is uh, it's interesting that the same people who say you know, we sh people should be able to uh, navigate these things are the ones who complain bitterly about how hard it is to file your income taxes, which yeah. is actually quite easy for most people, yeah. uh, and who complain bitterly about the length of legislation, uh -huh. which is right. usually there for a reason. The other thing is you know, there's parallel health care. Uh, although there are, you know, this, the system that we have now have is not the system anyone would have designed from scratch. Um, nonetheless, it's very clear that by requiring, placing requirements on what private insurers can do, what they can do in the individual market, we've created a much more competitive market in healthcare. It's actually been, it's, it's been remarkable how much better this is working than what we had before. And again, yeah, you need some rules so that people, people are not superhuman so that actually human beings can make informed choices. Right, traffic works better when we have stoplights and speed limits, and then people can get socialist. out and drive, right? You're a socialist. We're coming to that, we're Aren't coming you? to no, that. We're, no, do that. <laughs> we're coming to that. Okay, let me turn our attention to something that uh, I think may uh, mean a lot to many of us in this room. Uh, Senator, you've been a very powerful advocate uh, on issues related to student debt, yep. as we know. Uh, many Americans have learned from you recently that over 40 million Americans hold student debt, totaling $1.3 trillion. I also learned from you, which astonished me, $43 billion of that debt is held by people over age 60. Uh, remarkable. Think about that. Uh, so, of course, you've yeah. called for widespread student loan uh, refinancing and restructuring. So my question for you is what exactly is it exactly that you hope to see achieved uh, by the federal government and also by private lenders. So let me start on the point about student loans since I have the privilege of being here at a great university. Let me start by saying this is really personal for me. Um, I grew up in a family with a lot of ups and downs and there was no money for me to go to college. Um, I got a scholarship, uh, then got married at 19, dropped out of school. Oh boy, are you smart when you're 19. Uh, <laughs> I talk about this a lot in my book. Um, but, but I had a chance to go back to school, and I went to a commuter college that cost $50 a semester. And that opened about a million doors for a kid like me. So I just want to put this in the big picture. That's an America that's investing in the future. That's the America I grew up in, and that's the America I believe in. And if you want to ask where I want to go, with college, it's I want every kid to have that same kind of fighting chance to build a future. So it has gotten so far off from that. The cost of college has gone through the roof, uh, and kids have been told much more so than when I was growing up, if you want even a shot to make it in the middle class, you've got to have that college diploma. That's, that's the entry-level ticket for having your chance. And yet, with the cost of college going up, in effect, America has said to these young people, you're on your own. And if you're smart enough to be born into a family that has money, okay. But if you're not, that's a real struggle and it means student loan debt for so many millions of young people across this country, for so many families. So, the United States government says to young people, we get it, we get it. We're on your side, we're going to help you, we're going to lend you the money so you can pay this escalating cost for college, and we're going to charge you for it. Okay, that's fine, I get that you have to pay it back, only the trick is the price now on the student loans is enough to cover the interest on the loans, the, the value of the money, the bad debt losses, the administrative costs, and still produce <laughs> billions of dollars in profits for the United States government. Just to give you one little slice of that, the loans from 2007 
to 2012, just that slice, we happen to have the data on that, the cohort, is on target to produce $66 billion in profits for the United States government. Now think about that. So we say to young people, go out there, get an education, but the United States government's gonna make a profit on your backs. I think that is fundamentally wrong. So we have a bill pending right now in the United States Senate, and this one is urgent. We are gonna be voting on this next week in the Senate. And what the bill proposes is just to bring down the interest rate on student loans. 3.86% for undergraduate loans, a little higher for graduate and for uh, parent plus loans. It's the interest rate that both Democrats and Republicans agreed to last year for the new loans going out, but they didn't do anything for the $1.3 trillion in outstanding loans. So my view is you can refinance your house, you can refinance your business loan, you know, uh, towns are out there refinancing their loans. People should be able to refinance their student loans and squeeze some of the profits out. Now understand, yes, <laughs> at 3.85%, 86%, the government still makes a profit. I would like the interest rate much lower. The government still makes a profit, but it's just a much smaller profit. So that's the bill we've got pending. We're going to vote on it next week. But now, here's the hook in it. The government has built those anticipated profits into the budgets for the next 10 years. Think about that. So in order to pass this bill, we can't just all say, I know, let's lower the interest rate. We've got to find an offset in the budget or else we'll raise the deficit. So our proposed offset in the budget is to say, tell you what, how about if we ask millionaires and billionaires, people who make more than an adjusted gross income of a million dollars or more, pay at least the same interest rate that the median middle class family pays. If they paid that, we would have more than enough money to reduce the interest rate on student loans. So as I see it, we really have a choice on the table. As a country, the question is, how are we going to spend our resources? We can spend these billions of dollars as a country to preserve tax loopholes for billionaires, or we can spend pretty much that same money to reduce the cost of student loans. For me, this is a pretty simple choice. You can either support the billionaires who've already made it, or we can support the students who are trying to get started. My view is we've got to change the law, we've got to support the students. And that's what it's about. That's what I want. I don't, I don't have much to add except to say that this is just a piece of a... Uh, oh, of, you know, absolutely. The, the whole, even, even with this, we're going to still have a situation where education is becoming increasingly inaccessible unless you chose the right parents. And that's, uh, yeah. Uh, but nothing much more to say than that. So, Paul, do you think, though, that the relief of student debt is enough to act as a stimulus? It will help. I mean, we have, you know, it's, it's still a small number in spite of everything compared with the mortgage debt and, uh, and our failure to do anything real about, about relief for, for homeowners uh, is, is one of the great sins of our policy these past few years. But uh, sure, I mean, in, in general, and I think, I, you know, I'll take anything we can get. We, we've, you, the perfect, even the halfway decent is the enemy of the somewhat better in this, in this environment. And so you take whatever you can. And, and if, this, if this would help a little bit, this in itself is not going to be a big enough jolt. We need lots and lots of stuff, but, it's, uh, but it, every little bit helps. Although I want to be careful about not calling it a little bit in the, in the following sense. The Fed, the Treasury, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau have all pointed out that young people now are not buying homes yeah. at the rate that they should be. They're not buying cars at the rate we would expect. They're not starting small businesses. You're watching this cohort. And they are linking this now to student loan debt. So you bring it down. It won't fix everything, yeah. but you bring that down. And it does put money back into the pockets of people who are who are trying to make their lives work. Who are I'm a bit to too much them. of an academic here, uh, because I, I know that there, there there's are some no evidence. There, there, right. so there's some, I mean, it, the, the situation is complicated, and we, we don't really know. But you know, it, it's a good thing to do. It, it certainly is in the right direction. And it's, uh, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely what we, what we ought to be doing. Okay, I'll and, take it. And let me just say that I, I, the, the biggest problem for the young people is, is you know, is, is jobs. Uh, that's the, um, but uh, the student loan debt is just making it, uh, is, is an, added, an added stone on their back. Yeah. Senator Warren, what's the prospect for this bill? Well, um, look, the prospect if you don't get out there and fight for it is zero. So my view on this is we have to get out there and fight for it. Um, a little over a year ago, I proposed that we lend money to students to go to college at the same rate that we lend money every day to large financial institutions to finance their right. operations. Um, and when I proposed that, I stood alone. But within a few weeks, by the time we were fighting over whether to increase the interest rate on new students who were taking out loans, we moved that bill. And we had drawn enough attention to how much the government's making in profits off the backs of our students, and we moved that bill. And again, as, you know, as Paul rightly describes it, you'll take everything you can. But here's the difference. We voted on this student loan bill, because we've been out there working it and talking about it. Like I said, it's a little higher interest rate than I wanted, but it made other people more comfortable. So where are we? We have every single Democrat. We have both independents. And we have three Republicans who voted to move it forward. Now, that leaves you with 42 <laughs> Republicans who filibustered right. <laughs> and blocked the bill from moving forward in the Senate. But that's only two votes short. It's only two votes short, and it raises the fundamental question about every single policy issue that we're going to talk about. You've got billionaires on one side, people who want to keep everything that they've already made it big and want to hold on to it, and we've got how we build opportunity for the future on the other side. Billionaires versus students. This is a fight we have to have, and we have to be willing to get out there and fight it. If we fight it, I truly believe on this one, we win it. We will win this. We may not win it the first time around, but we will win it. We cannot turn this country over to those who believe that all of the benefits, all of the rules, everything in the system has to be tilted toward those who've already made it big. We have got to have a country that levels the playing field indeed that tilts it toward those who are trying to build a future. That's what it has to be. Okay, what can I say after that? <laughs> no huge disagreement yes. there. Right. Let me turn to another issue that I know concerns many of us, and uh, Senator, you've certainly spoken about recently. A lot of Americans have been, this is women's health care, the issue oh. of women's health care. A lot of Americans have been startled recently uh, by the resurgence of assaults on reproductive rights, especially on contraception. So here we are in 2014 debating whether employers can deny women access to birth control. Uh, what's your view on the so-called Hobby Lobby decision, the Supreme Court case? I think our audience probably all knows what this is. And what are the prospects for a legislative pushback uh, on the Hobby Lobby decision? I am genuinely appalled by the Hobby Lobby decision. I believe that it is not any employer's business whether or not a woman has access to birth control through her insurance policy. I just think that is fundamentally wrong. <laughs> In fact, let me tell you what the title of the legislative fix is. Uh, uh, Mark Udall uh, from Colorado, who by the way is in a, a, a race right now uh, to hold on to his seat in the Senate, and Patty Murray, uh, in the Senate, who's been a great leader, have a bill, and the title of the bill is Not My Employer's Business. <laughs> and, and I like that title. Uh, but this is the reminder on Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby was not decided as a constitutional matter. The court did not rule that corporations uh, have uh, uh, a uh, uh, constitutionally protected uh, religious rights. What they ruled is the, another statute called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, with the lovely acronym RIFRA, uh, uh, that this law permits in this case uh, a closely held corporation, the owners of a closely held corporation, to say that they were only going to provide insurance policies that had restrictions on women's reproductive 
healthcare, access to, to healthcare. Uh, what that means is we just change this. We can change it by statute. We can change it if we can get enough senators and enough representatives to change the law. President signs into law, and we have another law. To me, this is just like the student loan bill. This is, this is what do you think this country should look like? There are like these a half dozen or so issues that we should keep talking about. I know we're going to work through a lot of them that really fundamentally define who we see ourselves as, as a people and what kind of a country we're trying to build going forward. And for me, I just got to tell you, I cannot believe we are having this debate in 2014. Uh, that anyone thinks that it is okay to say we're going to put out health insurance policies, but some employers are going to say, I don't want you to have access to certain kinds of birth control to a woman. I, I just think that's deeply shocking, but we got the power to fix it, and by golly, we better fix it. Yeah, so I think that two things. One is, it, I mean, it, it was an outrageous decision by the court because it's, uh, um, this is not, you know, we're, we're not saying that, that you, the employer, uh, are, are doing some, you know, we're telling you you have to provide health insurance. So if we can do that, we can say, and, and it has to be the standardized package. It has to be what everyone is required to, you know, they, you, are, you are acting in effect as the agent of the body politic here. So this, this is an insane thing. And of course, um, trying to think that, that somehow, where exactly does the line end between an individual and you know, how, how, how closely held does a corporation have to be when it ceases to be a person? I, I would say no, no corporation is a person. Yeah, no I'll matter, go with that. No, no, no matter, no employer, you, you, your, your role as employer and your role as an individual is not the same thing. Uh, the other thing is I think that this is, should not be astonished to see this happening in 2014. Because it's there, that the deep roots of what's going on in our political system are much bigger and much scarier. It has to be, of course, you have to do the political fight as you do on individual issues. But we are fighting something that is quite scary, something that, well, you know, back in, the, um, not that long ago when, when Republicans were riding really high, when the, when the movement of conservatism was riding really high, uh, Grover Norquist said, oh, I don't want to roll back the New Deal, I want to roll back the progressive movement, mm -hmm. right? The, the real goal is to push us back to uh, um, not, not uh, to, you know, to, to 1894, not, uh, not, not even to 1924. So uh, this is a, this is, these are the stakes. This is, this is really serious stuff, and you fight it as a series of small battles, but uh, never forget just how big this thing is, really. Well, you know, you talk about it in terms of rolling back the progressive movement. You're exactly right, yeah. uh, and what Nordquist wants to do. But this one really hits hard at women. Yeah. In the same way that we can't get a bill passed on equal pay for equal work in 2014. I want you to think about this. You realize that women, and in, in, are at risk in many jobs around the country that if they ask how much the guy down the hall who's doing exactly the same work is getting paid for that work, that that's grounds for getting fired. Just to ask. So the idea that we have a government in which we're supposed to be able to participate equally we have an economy in which we're supposed to be able to participate equally, and yet an active movement that there are Republicans who filibustered both of, of these, or who are willing to filibuster, we haven't gotten the other one up yet, not my, not my employer's business, but who are willing to filibuster, who are willing to stand up and take a public vote to say, nope, I want to protect the right of employers to fire women for asking how much a guy is making. I want to protect the right of a closely held corporation to make sure that they can determine what kind of birth control a woman's going to have access to. This is one that's about the progressive movement. It is also very much about the women's movement, and right. it's something we're going to fight back on. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm going to push this one also. Another question that actually is essentially about, largely about working women, although not entirely. Uh, this is on the question about protections for shift workers and yeah. working time is a, a topic I'll indulge myself in saying I've worked on quite a bit here, including with some colleagues here at the Graduate Center. A lot of American workers, as you know, uh, struggle with unpredictable and uncontrollable work hours. And among other hardships, 
Workers often arrange childcare, and they travel to work only to arrive at their job to learn that their shift has been canceled along with their earnings for that day. The New York Times, I might add, has done some very nice coverage mm -hmm. on this recently. Um, you, Senator Warren, are now working towards legislation that would protect workers from these problematic scheduling practices. Can you tell us, what, tell us about the legislation and what you hope and expect to achieve? So I have co-sponsored a bill along with Senator Harkin. Uh, we also have a, a companion bill uh, that we hope to move in the House of Representatives. And it's just got some basic fairness around scheduling. So it starts with the idea that someone who asks for accommodation in scheduling can't be fired for asking. Um, a reminder of what the world looks like out there to a lot of people, that this is a necessary legal floor for them. Other parts of it include people who are called in for hourly work who are in retail and in food services, uh, in maintenance, uh, that if they're called in for work and then sent home before they get four hours of work, that they at least get paid for four hours worth of work. Um, part of this, like I said, is just trying to help people who are trying to put together the basics to move forward in their lives, a little bit more stability, a little bit more opportunity, another part of it, to put schedules out two weeks in advance. And if they have to be changed, they can be changed, but if you change them within 24 hours, you have gotta pay a little more to the employee. It's just a little acknowledgement that this costs people money, this costs people uh, uh, it's something out of their lives. And, just to try to get a little bit of balance in it. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. And, and I have to say on this one, this is one where the New York Times who's, uh, has really done some terrific work on this. It's reminding everyone else who isn't a shift worker, who, who isn't an hourly worker, who doesn't live in this world where you just get told to show up and when you show up, maybe there's gonna be work for you and maybe there's not and they just send you back home. Or they have you work for two hours and then you're off for three hours. Where are you gonna go for three hours? How, you can't do anything with this time. And then you have to be back for the next. And then the hardest part about it, if you complain, if you ask for something different, then you're fired because we're gonna take the next person. And so it's, again, it's just to try to build just, just a little leveling in the playing field. Yeah, so we talked a little bit uh, before about uh, the European comparison, which is something that comes up because yeah. we know the United States is wild west in our labor markets. The Europeans have a lot of stuff and the, the tendency here has been to say, well, you know, we can't be like that because that's such a disaster there. And this is where it's actually important to you know, know some facts here. So there was a time when European yeah, and there still are some European countries that are way over-regulated, but people to a large extent are living in, a, in they have an illusion about, about the way things are overseas and an illusion about our own system. So that here we have a romantic vision of our markets working and have no idea, most of you know, us upper middle class or, or above have no idea what it's like for, for people in, in, in shift work, people in, in hourly uh, employment. The other thing is we've, we're way out of date. It's kind of amazing to me that we have a kind of image of the way the rest of the world is that it was this kind of frozen 20 years in the past. I'm really actually very angry at the Europeans for making such a mess of their monetary affairs because it's, it's, it's made everything look bad, but it's, that's not. So here, quick fact. Um, um, so if we were looking at prime-aged adults, People 25 to 54, we are no longer in our prime. Anyway, the... Um, the uh, Speak for yourself, Buster. Right. <laughs> um, and we take America and we take the country everyone loves to hate and we know is a disaster because of the overregulation, France. So which country has a higher fraction of those prime age adults working? Yeah. And the answer is these days it's France by a large margin. Ours, they, they're not having any trouble at all creating jobs 
in the prime working years. They have policies that encourage a lot of people to retire early. You can talk about whether that's smart. They have a lot fewer young people working, although some of that may be obstacles to getting to the workforce, but part of it is actually your earlier issue, is that there's a lot more student aid, so there's a lot fewer French students trying to work their way through college. So, you know, they, the, the notion that we know that having this extremely harsh, often brutal, and often cheating system in the labor market is what you have to do to create jobs. It's just not true. Everybody believes it's true, but we've, we're, it's a propaganda thing. The reality is, yes, there is such a thing as overregulation, but there is such a thing as underregulation, and by God, do we have it. <laughs> indeed, and that's the argument, indeed, Paul, that we hear all the time, that these regulations gum up, these are gumming up the labor market in Europe. Yeah, and we are not. The American system of basically uh, you can do anything you like to workers is not actually working. You know, uh, we, we may have a delusion, but this is not this is not the Clinton boom anymore. This is this is America in 2014, and it's really not working at all for working Americans. Senator, why is this such a hard sell now politically? Um, there are two things we're supposed to really value in the United States. One is families, and the other is work. Yeah. Uh, but we make it so difficult for people who have families to work. Uh, do you think, do you feel some movement in the Senate? Do you think there's going to be some sympathy, for example, for this particular piece of legislation? So, I, you know, it's around every piece. And by the way, I just kind of like, got to put them out there as well. Minimum wage is also a huge part of this conversation, or should be. No one should work full time and still live in poverty. And yet, that's what's happened with our minimum right. wage. Right. Minimum wage workers have not had a raise in more than seven years, and I just want to make sure we all stay clear on how these pieces tie together. About two out of three minimum wage workers is a woman. Uh, these are women trying to support themselves. Uh, it, it, this is for me very personal. When I was 12, my father had a heart attack. It turned our family upside down. Um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, we lost the family station wagon, we were on the edge of losing our home. When she pulled on her best dress, blew her nose, put on her high heels, and walked to the Sears and got a minimum wage job. Because in those days, a minimum wage job would keep a family of three afloat. And that's what it did for our family. Today, a minimum wage job will not keep a mama and a baby out of poverty, full-time minimum wage. So that's part of it. Part of it, and I just want to add one more, is the fact that we don't build the facilities for childcare around this country. If we want people to be able to work, then we need to be supporting child, not just family leave, but the opportunity to have a good place where you, you can leave a child to support that. So the way I see this, is that is two parts, and I'll, I'll try to do both of them quickly. The first one is you ask what kind of, of resonance does this have in the Senate? Do we have any chance of moving the Senate? I'm going to tell you something. You leave the Senate to its own devices, it's not moving. Uh, it's going to be that people are going to move the Senate. It's going to be that women are going to move the Senate. It's going to be that low-wage workers are going to move the Senate. It's going to be that people who are involved and people who care are going to, students are going to move the Senate. When enough people say, on just a core set of issues, I want to know how you voted. Did you vote to help my family build a future? Did you hope, vote to help build a better world? for my children and my grandchildren. If you did, I'm with you. If not, you're not with me, so why should I be with you? And if we make that division, believe me, that's when the Senate will start to move. That's how I see it. Well, let me turn, I want to direct your attention to the issue of low pay, actually. Right. So as uh, the Senator has jumped the gun on my next question, Sorry. I'll, we'll forgive her that's there. That's fine. Good here. <laughs> of course, exactly. So because, of course, these issues yeah. are very, uh, they are interrelated. So we all know in the last three years there's been this tremendous uh, increase in worldwide attention to inequality in earnings and in income and in wealth. And as we've all talked about here at the Graduate Center, a lot of that attention has been directed to the top, the top 1% and higher, which we understand. But uh, I want to turn your attention uh, to the bottom, the bottom of the earnings distribution. And uh, Paul, as you know, uh, in fact, there were new, new data came out today that we looked at. Um, the U.S. relative to other rich countries has an enormous, large, low wa enormous uh, low-wage labor market using 
um, the OECD definition, which is two thirds of the median, a quarter of American workers you know, earn low pay, much higher than in other countries. So my question is, uh, do you think that public policy should aim to reduce the prevalence of low earners and how? Through raising and indexing the minimum wage, the earned income tax credit, strengthening collective agreements, what, where, how do we move this? Yeah, all of the above. Um, and no, I mean, and th there's actually a reason. We actually have, this is, this is a, it's kind of an interesting thing. I'm sorry, more professorial stuff. But, but there, there's a, this is two things. One about the minimum wage. Um, so I don't know, we need a word for the opposite of wishful thinking. Because what happens here is that there are a lot of people out there in, in the public debate who are determined to believe bad things in spite of overwhelming evidence that those bad things don't actually happen. So we have lots of very good evidence that says that actually raising the minimum wage does not cost a lot of jobs. It basically, the, 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 the estimates cluster around zero. We, we basically have pretty, you know, as good, this is the best researched area I know in economics, and it basically says raising the minimum wage from the very low levels we have, you know, make it $50 an hour, and I'll believe that it destroys jobs, but raising it from where we are now is not a job killer. It just makes poverty less. It makes people better off. Um, people don't want to believe that. Um, we also know that the earned income tax credit is a very, very good thing, it does a lot. And there's quite strong evidence that they actually complement each other. That the earned income tax credit on its own, a fair bit of the benefits leak away to employers rather than to workers. Minimum wage on its own, we, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not perfect, it's not going to get everybody. Put the two of them together and you're doing a very, very effective way of raising low you know, raising the, the incomes of low-wage workers. So we actually know how to do this, and it's not even a lot of money, because the thing about low-wage workers is they earn very low wages, and a relatively modest amount of money makes a big improvement in them. So, so we can do this, and uh, the, there are obviously huge political obstacles, but this is one of those things, it just does not have to be the way it is. We, are, we have a, a working underclass in this country that's completely gratuitous, that an advanced country like ours doesn't have to have, and basically no one else does. So let's talk about the politics of this, okay? I, I, Americans want to see us raise the minimum wage. Look at, the, look at any yeah. of the data on this. What is it? About 70%, that's where most yeah. of these come in, say, yeah, we should raise the minimum wage. We should give minimum wage workers a raise. So why doesn't it happen? Well, you know, let's disaggregate the data for just a minute. Did you see the piece that uh, the Demos group put together? A terrific think tank. And what they did, we've got Demos here, good, okay. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Demos uh, for this, because it's so startling when you look at their charts. They say, you know, look, at most Americans, you do the, the distribution, a random sample of Americans, about 70% want to raise the minimum wage. But you look at rich people, you look at the top end of the income spectrum, and it drops off, what is it, to about 40%? Yeah, they're not very enthusiastic about raising the minimum wage. So who does Congress listen to? Are they listening to all the people, or are they listening to those who hire lobbyists, who hire lawyers, who make lots of contributions to political campaigns? Who are they listening to? And the answer is, they're listening to those who can afford already, who are organized already, who already have the resources to hire those lobbyists to make sure that they are well protected. So we have a Congress right now that has the built-in tilt. It's the tilt in favor of protecting those who've already made it and carrying out the wishes, whether they are based in fact or not, carrying out the wishes of those who've already made it rather than the wishes of the country at large. I think that's at the heart of the problem here. It's not just this issue. It's and it's not. And it shows up over I was just and look, over. I was just looking at the, um, this great work that Russell Sage actually backed on, on trying to figure out what does, what does the 1% want. And it turns out that the budget deficit, which most Americans really don't care about at all, is priority right up there. And guess what our policy has been directed towards? That's right. That's Senator right. Warren, let me ask a question about politics also. Um, it's interesting that a lot of the movement in this country on increasing the minimum wage and establishing a living wage is taking place at the state and local level mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. 
Um, what do you think about this? Does working at the state and local level strengthen or weaken the prospects for national level policy development? So I think it, it strengthens it. I'm, I'm a supporter. And I'm a supporter for two reasons. One is because it gets harder to argue with the facts. Right. Right? But nothing succeeds like showing that it actually works. So when the minimum wage goes up and we've got more people working and we've got fewer people who need food stamps or need other forms of assistance, then we get these examples. Uh, the other thing it does is it, it's the reminder of empowering people. You know, I get frustrated with the United States Senate. I'm sure other people do too. Uh, because it feels like a hard thing to move. If you can move your city, then move your city. If you can move your state, then move your state. But the reality is I never want to lose this. It's not enough. I support it. I think it's good. I like to see us move in that direction. But it does not let us off the hook. We need to raise the minimum wage across this country, not just in localities. Just um, history. Uh, the New Deal mm -hmm. really started as, as state and local initiatives. A lot of it was pioneered, actually, in the city and then the state of New York. Uh, by Al Smith and FDR, which is very, a very good precedent. But of course, it, it, you needed the national thing to make it really go the whole way. So this is, no, I mean, I, for our hopes for, it, uh, for a new New Deal, um, they, they, this is, I think some of us thought everything was going to change in 2008, and it didn't. But, uh, but um, this is how it happens. It happens piecemeal at first, and then eventually it becomes a national consensus. Yeah, your mouth to God's ears. Yes. OK. Uh, let me turn to a sort of big think question, if I could. Uh, I want you both to think about markets, which we've talked about a little bit. And Paul, you sort of tipped this question already. But I do have to begin by saying your critics love to call you socialists, both of you. <laughs> um, socialists. So being a good researcher, I decided to check this. And I Googled this morning, Paul Krugman is a socialist. <laughs> and I got 95,000 hits. And then I Googled Elizabeth Warren is a socialist, and I got 170,000 hits. There we are. So clearly, you're both pretty socialisty. Um, <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, I was listening to you, Senator Warren. Recently, you were interviewed at the Kennedy Library by E.J. Dion, mm -hmm. and I was so taken by this, I wrote it down. You said, I love capitalism. I love markets. I think markets really are terrific at what they do. And Paul, you are similarly quoted in an exchange with Ron Paul, I don't know why you were having an exchange with Ron Paul, but oh God, <laughs> you can tell us. Unfortunately, um, I do. <laughs> you said, uh, "I'm actually a believer in the market economy. I'm a believer in capitalism. I want the market economy to be left as free as it can be." So, my question to both of you, Paul, first, if you would, to in all seriousness, and to borrow a, a phrase from Bob Kuttner, what are the virtues and the limits of markets? Okay. So, the wonderful thing about markets is that they are, when they're working right, they're a um, a decentralized way of getting stuff done. They rely on individual initiative. You can get a lot of stuff. You know, if you were, you really don't want uh, a government body. Uh, you don't want a, a Gosplan USA to to you know get the, the the fish and the vegetables in your in your neighborhood supermarket. It, that's that's something that is really does work very well. It, it exploits people's self-interest. It allows them to make their own decisions. All of which is great. Markets have been proved by you know, a lot of experience to be a really good way of organizing lots of stuff. The thing is, the thing that, that you, where you need to hold, you know, take a, a full stop and then think about it for a second is first, that's not true for everything. There are lots of things that markets won't do well, like providing roads, like providing, uh, actually it turns out healthcare is one of those things where a free market uh, on, on, without government intervention does a very bad job. Uh, the other is, there's a very insidious thing, which I think is the fundamental dividing line between people like Senator Warren and myself and people who call us socialists, is the market is a great thing. It is not a source of justice and morality. The income that somebody happens to receive from the market, uh, fine, we, we're, we're OK with that. But that is not necessarily um, the final word on what that person is entitled to. People who, for whatever reason, aren't able to make a lot of money on the market are still, if they're citizens of the United States, entitled to a decent life. You know, the, the market is, is a, is, I guess, 
I would say I'm for markets, I'm for capitalism, but basically um, because they work well most of the time, not because they are, not, you don't want to deify the market. You don't want to say this is, this is the way it has to be and anything that isn't is wrong. It's just part of how we make a good society, but there's lots of other things we need to do to make a good society, and, um, and that's, that's, that's the point. It, you know, the United States is a democracy. That's what defines us. We're not, we're not a free market as a definition. We use free markets to make ourselves work as a democracy, but we're not about the markets, we're about the democracy. I agree. I agree. So I'll pick up where, where Paul left that, and that is, we are democracy, and so the hard question is about the relationship between our government and our markets. That's what this is all about. And as I see it, there are two key things that government is doing in markets. There are some other pieces, but these are kind of the heart of it for me. One is the rules. Just, you know, why we have traffic lights, why we say you don't get to sell uh, medicine, you know, white pills and call them aspirin if in fact that's not what it is. What are the set of rules? And they are rules that keep those marketplaces level and fair. Just enough that people can see them and can engage in the transactions. Enough so that some competitor who wants to get out there and produce a good product knows that that competitor is in a market that's an honest market and if you produce a better product, consumers will be able to see the difference. It's the set of rules. That part is absolutely key. The second part is the part about making the investments together that none of us can make alone. Paul alluded to this when he mentioned roads, but I'll just right. make it the bigger point. It's infrastructure. Markets have to have infrastructure, everything. We, it, we have people start a business, that's great, but you're gonna need roads and bridges to get your goods to market, you're gonna need power to plug in, you're gonna need water, you're going to need police services, you're gonna need the basic infrastructure so that this market can work. And infrastructure won't happen on its own. You can't count on somebody to build the road in front of her house and you know maybe her neighbors will do the same and somehow we'll have an international or an interstate transportation system. It won't work that way. That's the role that government plays. Government comes in and says we're all gonna pitch a little in so that we'll be able to build this infrastructure. And we go beyond it in the infrastructure. We say we're all gonna pitch something in on education. Why? Partly because we believe as a people that every kid ought to get a chance out there. But partly because we say, we think that if we have an educated workforce, we're gonna have more opportunities in this market, be able to build more things and raise the standard of living for all of us. So we make those investments together. Third big area for me is research. Research, we invest in medical research and scientific research and engineering research. To me, this is part of what makes us extraordinary as a country, extraordinary as a people. We make this investment in research because we don't know what's gonna be invented from it, but we believe that if we build a big pipeline of ideas, that our children and our grandchildren will be able to make things out of that that we can't even dream of. Those are the things we do together. Markets have wonderful parts that are all about individuals who start their own businesses, who come up with great ideas, who who turn them into something wonderful, about people who get out every day and work hard, but they are also about the part we do together. And that's the part that we have left out of this argument. We can't have markets that function unless we have a government that functions. That's the heart of it. I actually wanted to just add just because of where we are, yeah. uh, both, both CUNY and, and in the city. So here we are in New York City. And New York City, you know, people living here is, actually it's mostly not that expensive except housing, which is a big thing, which is you know, 60, 70, or in Manhattan, I guess, well over that, more expensive than the average of the country. So why are people here? 
they're here because of the opportunities that are here, because of, and what do those opportunities come from? They come from all the other people who are here, they come from the interaction among them, they come from the incredible infrastructure that despite, you know, some of the uh, ups and downs the city has. And I find it incredible that somebody can actually have made the decision to be in this crowded place, this expensive place, because of all those opportunities, and then say, but all that money is money I made, and you have no right, it's all me, it's all my individual stuff, and, and how does the government think it has any right to, to tax some of that away to pay for some of these things that make this place where I wanna be? This, is, this, this city, I mean, America as a whole, but this city is an overwhelming demonstration of, of how we are more than the sum of our parts, which is why we need more than markets. We, we need a government to make those markets work. We have gotten some questions from the audience, uh, all of which are really interesting and it's painful to choose, but I'm gonna ask you this question and I'll let either of you jump in first. Uh, we've said almost nothing about labor unions this evening. Um, do unions have a role to play anymore? Yes, yes, yes. Oh God, yes. Unions built America's middle class. Right. Uh, and, and they built it in multiple ways. They built it partly by getting out there and fighting for uh, uh, better working conditions, for fighting for higher wages, for fighting for uh, uh, the eight hour work day. Uh, I saw a bumper sticker the other day, you know, uh, uh, the weekend brought to you by the unions. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, so part of it is that, and, and all of that spread. So the collective negotiation then spread to other workers, whether they were unionized or not. But I want to pitch in on the second part about why unions were important, and that is unions also helped fight for things that were good for all workers, whether they were unionized or not. They're out there in the fight on minimum wage. They were in the fight on Medicare to help us get it. They were in the Civil Rights Voting Act. They were part of those fights to say the American people deserve a voice. They deserve a better country. The unions work collectively on behalf of the workers. The unions built America's middle class, and I truly do believe they're going to be at least a big part of helping rebuild America's middle class. In this, in this state with the highest rate of unionization, I might add, is where, where we sit today. So That's okay. right. Although Massachusetts no, just is not far behind. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, not, not too much to add, except that, yes, I mean, they, um, I always think whenever unions come up, I always, baby boomer, I always think Joni Mitchell, you don't know what you got till it's gone. Uh, <laughs> a strong union movement, it, you know, unions, when they were strong, could be sometimes annoying, but it turns out that they are provided middle class jobs to a lot of people, and also, critically, are a counterweight politically uh -huh. to the power of organized money. And, uh, and we have lost a lot with that decline, and we need it back. How can the decline of unions be turned around? Oh, it's, you know, unions have, have declined in some places. It, they, they've declined to some extent in most advanced countries, but not to the extent that they've declined here. It's not some law. You say, oh, well, manufacturing doesn't employ as many people as it used to. Who said that service industries, you know, why, why isn't Walmart unionized? There's absolutely no fundamental reason why that should not be a, a unionized firm. And think about how different this country would be if it were. It's, there, there is really no law that says that it, it was, in fact, a concerted political assault. You look at the sharp decline of unions during the 80s, and that, was not, that didn't just happen out of thin air. That was happened because there was a, a campaign of union busting, much of it illegal, that was enabled by the very intentioned blind eye that the Reagan administration turned to it. So it's, it's not, it, this is something that is not hard except, except it's politically very difficult. But if you ask what would it take to rebuild a strong union movement, if we wanted it, we could have it back. I'm going to ask a final question uh, that came from the audience. I have a feeling we could discuss this, you could discuss this until tomorrow morning, but uh, I don't think you will. Uh, the question is the following, and it's a statement and then a question. Until we fix campaign finance, yep. Washington will remain dysfunctional and polarized, gridlocked and out of touch with the population. Is it true to say that we must fix this first? I don't think, I, I mean, it's, it's important, but you know, um, you can do a lot. I mean, I, I actually, I'm, I'm in a peculiar position here because I actually look at the last, um, the last 10 years and I don't feel terrible. I actually say, you know, we had 
a, you know, enormous improvement in healthcare, even though it's, it's not the system we would have devised and it won't get everybody, but this is an enormous achievement. We have a financial reform that falls short on a number of respects, but is in many ways an enormous achievement. It's not the case that we can't get anything done. By all means, we do need to fix campaign finance reform, but if you think that the American system is a total failure in this past, I, I remember 2004. I remember the way the country looked then, and I think this is, we've made, you know, we've done some incredibly positive things, despite having that hill of, of money to climb. Uh, so no, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's important, but it's not a sine qua non. It's not something that we have to have or nothing else can be made better. So I'm not nearly as cheerful as you okay. are. Okay. <laughs> That's because you actually have to deal with the beast but every day, and I don't. But that may be because I had to raise a lot of money yeah. to get this Senate seat. Right. Uh, I know. <laughs> so I, I want to do this in, in both directions. The, the first part is money is strangling our democracy. Uh, and it's felt in a million different ways. It's felt in big ways when we can't raise the minimum wage. It's felt in, 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 in small ways uh, through every regulatory agency in this country. Uh, the wind only blows one way, and that is to hear from those who have money, who need just one little exception in the rule, who need just one little complication in the, in the, the new agency directive, always pushing, money is always pushing, in the direction of tilting the playing field, of making it so that those who've already made it have outsized influence in Washington, and those who are out there just, just trying to build something are always on the hanging on by their fingernails end of this slide. So to me, this is the heart. This is what threatens democracy. We can't continue to run a country where a tiny fraction, where the Koch brothers get to determine who's going to run on the Republican ticket for the United States Senate and the House of Representatives and then go absolutely blast money on voters until they persuade enough people that their candidates should be the candidates that win. Democracy can survive for a while, but it cannot survive forever under this kind of onslaught. The problem we've got is the United States Supreme Court, and the United States Supreme Court that has famously brought us to the point of corporations being people that seem to have better rights than our own people do. So this is going to be a really long haul. So this is going to take me to what should we do? The first part is even given the United States Supreme Court, Citizens United, all of the things that it has done uh, to open up, uh, uh, to let billionaires have outsized influence in the political conversation. We still have the power under those Supreme Court decisions to pass laws in Congress that require instant and vigorous disclosure of whose money is being spent and who is behind that advertisement, who is coming in here and influencing you. That's something that the United States Congress can do, and it's something the United States Congress should do. And if you think it's impossible, let me just point out to you, we came within one vote of getting that done back in 2011. I think I have the year right. Uh, the guy I beat for the Senate was the one who voted to keep the filibuster in place so it right. failed. Uh, but, so that's part of it. But the third part is this goes back, there's a part I disagree with in, this, in the sentence that was at the beginning, and that is you've got to fix it first. You've got to fix campaign finance reform before you can fix Washington. Nope, you've got to fix them at the same time. Yep. You've got to fix Washington. And the way we fix Washington is yes, there's concentrated money, there's concentrated power on one side. Yes, billionaires have outsized influence, but there's a whole lot of the rest of us, a whole lot of the rest of the people. When we get organized, when we make our voices heard, that's when 
we push back, and that's when Congress begins to move. And I just want to sit here and remind everybody, before you say, whoa, which one of them is the academic? This woman says all we need to do is get everybody organized and we can change the world. Right. Hold on. I just want to remind you where we started this conversation. In 2009, I had an idea for Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And I went around Washington and talked to a lot of people, a lot of our friends on our right. side, and they told me two things. They said, great idea. That could actually make a real difference. That was number one. Then they said, don't do it. <laughs> and the reason they said don't do it is they said, don't even waste your breath. Don't spend your time on this because you cannot possibly win. The banks are going to fight financial reform tooth and nail, but number one on their hit list is going to be that Consumer Financial Protection right. Bureau because it's going to cost them real money. It's going to force a market that really works. And um, so, you know, I'm, I heard this as try harder, you know. Um, <laughs> right. I read too many Nancy Drew novels growing up. <laughs> Intrepid girl policymaker. So, so I just got out there and kept fighting for it. And I, I could tell a very long and involved story. In fact, I do talk about this in the book. The first uh, conference call on the, the new consumer agency, first conference call, there were two people on it, which I think legally does not qualify as a conference call. <laughs> but two became four, and four became 10, and 10 became 100. Groups got involved. Groups for whom consumer financial products were not their first issue. The AFL-CIO, God bless them, stepped up to the plate and said, we will be part of this effort. The steel workers said, we'll be part of this. AARP said, we're in. NAACP said, we are in. La Raza said, let us talk to folks. The, the banks spent more than a million dollars a day for over a year lobbying against financial reform and particularly against the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. But we all know what happened at the end. At the end, enough people spoke. It was a time where we were all paying enough attention. We pushed hard enough on Congress. And when we got a vote out in public, we got enough votes to build a good, strong, tough, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We did it, and we did it together. I think that was my point. <laughs> and that, no, it's not your point. <laughs> OK. You finally have an argument. In the following sense. No, no, no okay. it is. It, it is and it isn't. All right. The point is not, can we keep getting through a consumer agency, and can we struggle and get through the student loan bill? to cut the interest rate on student loans, voting on it next Wednesday, bankonstudents.com. That's my commercial for now. Uh, right. Go sign up. Be part of this. Can we do these? Yeah, we can. It takes a superhuman effort to do these, but we can do them. We can do them. But the point is, we have got to do financial yes. reform. We have got to do campaign finance reform. We've got to get it done. Together, we've got to change Washington, but it's going to take all of us changing it. The folks for whom Washington works, I mean, do understand this. The rest of us talk about gridlock and isn't it awful in Washington. There's a whole group of people for whom, nope, works pretty good. Uh, not changing anything, aces, you know, it's, it's working out. Agencies that, you know, well, they kind of muddle along and put things in, that's all working. If we really want Washington to work for us, then we got to reach out and just make it happen. we got to be willing to fight for it. I think anything I say will be superfluous. Say again. I did, did, no, nothing. Yes. nothing. Um, let me, <laughs> let me um, I have a point, but I'll make start it. to bring us, sadly, to a close. But I want to ask each of you to take the opportunity to say anything uh, 
that might be on your mind to the great City University of New York Graduate Center audience and to the live stream audience. Paul, I'm noting you're becoming alarmingly optimistic and cheerful. I, I like to <laughs> oh. think that's because you've been here at the Graduate Center, but right. um, any no, last thoughts? No, I, partly I think I'm trying to do a little bit of a counterweight. I think there's a lot more doomsaying uh, about the prospects for achieving good stuff than, than there should be. You know, people look and say, oh, you know, Obama's low approval rating, failed presidency. I, don't, I think achieving health reform that progressives have been seeking for 40 plus years is not a failed presidency. Achieving a major, you, bet. you know, achieving the CFPB, achieving um, these things. So this is, this is saying that there is positive stuff. Now, there, there's huge problems, obviously, and I'm, I'm scared, you know, and then start thinking about environmental issues and I can become as doomy and gloomy as anyone. But, but the point is, I, I think this is why I really, really we agree that, that we have actually seen in these past few years a demonstration of, of how despite a system that is rigged against good stuff, nonetheless, good things can happen if, if, you, if you try hard enough. And so this, I, I don't, I think this is, this is the last time we should be cynical about the prospects for change. You should be appropriately cynical about how Washington works right now. You should be appropriately cynical, and it's not just campaign finance. Right? If we had more time, I'd like to talk about the revolving door and the oh. gravitational pull of, of Wall Street. But, but, but nonetheless, we've made, you know, I, I, I've, I started, healthcare was my crusade for quite a while, a lot of other people too. And some people say, oh, it's not the plan we wanted. And, uh, but my God, about 10 million people who were uninsured have gained insurance this year, probably a comparable number next year. My God, that's a huge improvement in the lives of a lot of my fellow citizens. So I'm, in that sense, I think we need to, we need to not rest on, you know, not, not beat ourselves and say, what a great job we did, but just say, this, this, we can, good things can happen, and some good things have happened, important ones. No, Senator? And I think, I think Paul is right. I think cynicism is cheap, and I'm, I'm, I'm not signing up for it. If you don't like something, then what are you doing to fix it? For me, that's what this is all about, you know? Yeah. And my view is a lot of folks see the problems. You know, much of this is not rocket science. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a big and complicated, uh, you know, there was a Nobel Prize involved in this, but no, not that the economy. Part. Not and, that part. And, <laughs> not for rocket science. But we know some basic things we need to do together. And we know these things that we need to, I mean, this is nuts. We, the United States Congress was, couldn't get a highway transportation bill passed. This was kind of you know, like one of the routine things we did in government. So what we got to do is we got to be willing to get out there and fight for these core pieces. It seems to me that this is a moment where democracy is being tested. It, does democracy devolve over time into something that really is about those at the very top, those who can influence the lawmakers, those who can always make their voices heard in the elections? Or is it about the, the spark of what we do together? Is it about how we define ourselves by the work we do individually to build for ourselves and our family, but also the work we do together to, to make this country a country that is full of opportunity again, a country that builds yeah. a real future for ourselves and our kids and our grandkids. I, I believe we're getting to the 11th hour on this one. I mean, this is scary to me. And when I look at the kinds of problems we have to solve, the environmental problems, the worldwide economic problems that we face, when we watch what's happening in the Middle East and we watch what's happening in Ukraine, there's tough stuff going on in this world. We need to be doing our part here at home together. We need to make this government work to get back on track so we're building something strong here at home so that we really do have a fighting chance to take on the hard problems that are bearing down on us. I truly believe we are in great danger, but I also truly believe we can do this. We can do this.
We just have to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Thank you. 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 Thank you, Paul. Okay. Good. Great. Good. Thank you.